So this topic uh, is uh, the title is pretty interesting. Really, really, really large numbers by Rishabh Vaidh. So yeah, my talk is titled "The Biggest Number in the World Plus One." Okay, so we're going to see some really big numbers today. Okay, so full disclosure. Okay, this talk is not original, and several parts were shamelessly copied from an essay by Professor Scott Aronson. So anyone who finds this talk should definitely read the essay because the jokes are definitely better. Okay, so continuing. And the following is a conversation that happened between me and X. Now X's identity shall remain protected. but i can tell you all that she's a 20 year old girl who's pursuing a degree in economics so i say to x do you know researchers at iit b recently discovered the biggest number possible and she says really wow what is it you know and i say it's a million million quadrillion and she said wow that's really cool you know so when you hear a conversation like this there's many possible reactions you know you can laugh at the state of the indian education system you can laugh at the girl's mathematical ability you can laugh at art students in general and personally i did all of these but once you're finished laughing you know you start thinking and what you find is that as human beings we don't have much of an intuition for big numbers okay our mental number line sort of extends till 10 everything after that is infi okay and even if i take a sample space of the people in this room all of us iitians you know we're all very smart and very you know mathematically talented but i am sure that most of us don't really have an idea of how big it is that numbers can actually get okay and one way to formalize this opinion is the following competition okay so who can name the bigger number and the name explains it all right rules of this competition are simple i'll give you all 10 seconds okay you can use any sort of notation you wish you can use the english language and you have to write down a number and a reasonable modern mathematician must be able to determine your number using only what you've written and the published literature that's it okay and of course infinity isn't allowed so you can't say okay everyone's number plus 1 anything like that okay it has to be a well defined number but the mathematician has infinite resources at his disposal okay he has a subscription to every journal ever he has a lot of time so yeah a few typical responses when you play this game so a first grader says something like 99999 he fills his page up with nines and a smarter first grader would probably write ones because ones take less time to write they take less space to write so you know you can get many times bigger and an art student might scratch his head for a while and say something like 87 i don't know uh yeah a freshman here at iit might you know do something ingenious by stacking up the exponentials so you might say 9 raised to 9 raised to 9 raised to 9 and so on and by the time you're a sophie you don't really care anymore you've got mood i tech fest and but a ma or a cs and to sophie might say something like 9 tetrated to 9 and you know we've already entered unknown territory because i'm sure a lot of people here don't know what tetration is so in our search for big numbers jump off point is the exponential function okay so now everyone knows the exponential function whether you're from cs elac mac okay exponential function pops up everywhere and it grows really fast i mean this is one of the worst abstruse goose comics ever but it illustrates the point nicely so can you all read it you all can right so basically you know if you walk along the number line by the time you reach 20 your exponential image is whizzing past the moon at the speed of light so exponentials get really big really fast right but you might say you know so what you know we all we all know the exponential we saw it in the seventh standard you know get bigger than that so fair enough we get bigger than exponentials so how do we define exponential you know the basic seventh standard definition because we're working with whole numbers here okay so it's repeated multiplication right and what is multiplication it's basically repeated addition so maybe there's a trend over here right and you know let's extrapolate the trend beyond exponential so let's try repeated exponential right and we end up with what we call tetration repeated tetration pentation repeated pentation hexation blah 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 okay so this guy wilhelm ackermann you know he had a really bright idea so he defined what we call the ackermann sequence right 
So in the previous slide, we defined the hierarchy of operations, right? Each more powerful than the last. So the Ackermann sequence, you basically have every natural number n operating on itself with the nth operation, right? So that's a little convoluted, the definition, but we can see the example. So a of 1 is 1 plus 1, because addition is the first operation. That's 2. a of 2 is 2 into 2, because multiplication is the second operation. 4. 3 raised to 3, 27. So, you know, uh, 2, 4, 27. You know, these numbers don't look so big, right? So, yeah. The Ackermann sequence is still big. But then, of course, we come to a of 4, and it's 4 raised to x, where x is that number. Right, so originally I thought that I'd actually write out Ackermann of 4 on these slides, you know, because it sort of gives an effect, right? But I knew it's a big number, so I tried to calculate it with Mathematica, and my laptop crashed, okay? So then I did some math, and it turns out Ackermann of 4 has 10 raised to 154 digits. Number of observable atoms in the physical universe is 10 raised to 83, so that was hopeless, right? But basically, moral of the story, don't judge a sequence by its first three terms, okay? So yeah, the Ackermann sequence. It gets really big, as you all can see. And then, of course, you all can combine the Ackermann sequence with itself. You all can take Ackermann off Ackermann, or Ackermann raised to Ackermann, or anything like that, right? We have many different ways to combine them. So, you know, Ackermann of 1111 is good enough to decimate the unschooled opponent. But sure, it's bigger than anything I've ever seen, but I want something even bigger, right? So, fair enough, we can come up with a paradigm that makes the Ackermann numbers look arbitrarily small. You know, provably so. We can prove that it makes them look arbitrarily small. So, before that, we take a slight detour in the CS theorem. Right? And, yeah, a disclaimer before we take this detour. So, I love the Greek alphabet, okay? And I'm a big fan of mathematical rigor. I mean, if you ever want to pick up a girl in a bar, you know, you just give her this proof that 0 and 2a is equal to 0 for all a, and she'll be falling for you real fast. But, you know, this is a popular science talk, so I will gloss over a few technical details in the next few slides. And, you know, those of you all who are offended by that, I'm deeply sorry. Those of you all who are confused, you know, feel free to interrupt me at any time, and I'll explain whatever it is that you can't understand. So, yeah, Turing machines. So we need a concept called Turing machines, which is basically this. You've got an infinite tape, which extends in both directions, and you've got a tape head, right? A tape head has a certain set of instructions. Depending on what the tape head reads on the tape, it performs a certain instruction. So it's basically an abstract version of an all-purpose computer, right? With the strip being the input, and the instructions in the tape head form the program, right? So I think everyone's clear on that, right? Turing machines. Fair enough. So, you know, given a certain set of rules, a Turing machine can either halt after a finite duration of time, or it can get stuck in an infinite loop. Like, we all know of the programmer who got stuck in the Shah because his shampoo bottle read rather than repeat, right? So, yeah, a program can get stuck in an infinite loop. So, Turing asked the question, is there a Turing machine which can tell us if a given Turing machine halts or not, right? And so, turns out there isn't. There isn't any procedure by which we can find out if a given Turing machine halts or not, and this is called the halting theorem. So, you know, many times in science we come across stories about people that discovered things, you know. So Archimedes was in the bath when he discovered buoyancy, and an apple fell on Newton's head, right? So here's what I like to believe happened when Turing discovered the halting theorem. Right? So maybe Turing and his buddies went out for a boys' night out, and you know they probably have too many drinks and they come back, and Turing's lying down, he's staring up at the ceiling, and he says, "Dude, do you think God could create a rock so heavy that he himself could not lift it?" Right? And his best friend in the whole world, Gödel, you know, who later onwards came up with the incompleteness theorem says, man, that is so beautiful. You have to totally write this stuff down, you know. And Turing did write it down. It was his PhD thesis, if I'm not I don't know whether it was his PhD thesis. Don't quote me on that. But he did write it down, and he took about 40 pages to write it down. But the essence of the proof is contained right here, okay? So I won't go into the technical proof, but the essence is contained right here in this slide. There's a lot of self-referentialism going on over there. So, yeah. What does all of this have to do with big numbers? 
So, you know, I'd like if you all concentrate for the next two slides. It's a little involved. I'm going to give you all a construction. So we can classify Turing machines by the number of rules n in the tape head, right? So there'll be a certain finite set of Turing machines with two rules in the tape head. There'll be some Turing machines with 10 rules in the tape head, so on and so forth. Now, uh, for a given n, you know, you've got a finite set of machines. Some of these machines halt, others continue forever, okay? When started on a blank tape, okay? So now of the ones that halt, let BB of n be the maximum number of time steps that are taken before the machine halts. So say I have three instructions, okay? And I have a million machines with three instructions, say. And one of these halts after 10 steps, one of these halts after 20,000 steps, okay? So the maximum number of steps that are taken before a machine halts, right? Of the ones that halt after a finite amount of time is BB of n. BB of n is called the nth busy beaver number, right? So this comes from a more innocent time when you could actually use a word like busy beaver, you know, in a research paper. So yeah, so what? So our claim is that BB of n grows faster than any computable sequence. Any computable sequence. You write it down, you know, you write down the Ackermann numbers, BB of n grows faster than that. You screw around in any exotic way that you want with the Ackermann numbers, BB of n grows faster than that, okay? So how could you actually go about proving something like this? So the proof turns out to be pretty simple, actually. Right? We, don't, we actually sidestep all the issues that come up with this beautiful proof. Use reductio ad absurdum. So, you know, say we can upper bound each BB with a computable sequence, D of n, called the beaver dam, right? So now the halting problem can be easily solved because given a Turing machine with n instructions, we can just run it till D of n. If it hasn't halted by that time, it's never going to halt, right? Because D of n is bigger than BB of n. Everyone got this, right? Everyone who's paying attention at least. If y'all didn't, I can explain it again. You want me to explain it again? Okay, cool. So yeah, so hence by reductio ad absurdum, D of n cannot exist. So BV of n finally supersedes every computable sequence. So sample values of the busy beaver numbers are given as forth, you know, they've been calculated after a lot of hard work. The busy beaver numbers, I think, came out in 62. Now in 2011, we know for a fact that BB of 5 is bigger than 47 million, but the exact value hasn't been pinned down to this day, right? So, yeah. so busy beaver numbers are all well and good, you know, but what if you're competing with these guys? Right, I mean, they'll chew you up and spit you out because they've been using busy beavers since they were five years old, right? I mean, the guy in the swimming goggles, you know, he's going to give a talk after me, so you can get an idea for what I'm talking about. So yeah, ek se mera kya hoga, you know, busy beaver of 999 se mera kya hoga. So the final paradigm that I'm going to give you all, you know, the final arrow in the big number quiver, something called Kleene's hierarchy. There's many analogs of Kleene's hierarchy. This is just one of the names it has. Some of you all might know it as a polynomial hierarchy in complexity theory, right? So say we had a black box, and computer scientists call these black boxes oracles, which could solve the halting problem, right? So given a Turing machine, this black box tells you whether the machine halts or not. We don't know the details of the black box, but God gives it to us. So if we allow queries to this black box, so say we attach this black box with our Turing machine, right? We get a super Turing machine. So now this Turing machine is, can boldly go where no Turing machine has gone before, right? Because it can solve the halting problem. So, but of course the super Turing machine comes with its own super halting problem. Because you can always ask it, does this super Turing machine halt or not? Right? So you have your own super halting problem. And hence you have super busy beaver numbers, BB2 of N. Now one thing to note is that if you have super Turing machines, the busy beaver numbers become computable. Okay, that's easy enough to see. So now, busy beaver two of n has to grow even faster than busy beaver of n. Otherwise the super, super halting problem would be solvable, basically. So now we've come up with a paradigm that gives us numbers that can get even bigger than the busy beaver numbers, right? And continuing in this fashion, you know, we can define super duper halting problems. Super duper busy beaver numbers. Super duper pooper busy beaver numbers. You know? And you can extrapolate this, right? I mean, we've all seen that TV show, I think, Global Guts, you know, where 
पहले इट वॉज दी एग्रो क्रैक देन इट वॉज द मेगा क्रैक यू नो एंड नाउ इट्स द सुपर एग्रो क्रैक सो ऑफकोर्स यू कैन कीप ऑन गोइंग सो इन समरी यू नो द नेक्स्ट टाइम यू गो फॉर अ जॉब इंटरव्यू एंड दे आस्क यू राइट डाउन अ रियली बिग नंबर राइट डाउन समथिंग लाइक बी बी सेवन ऑफ वन 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 एंड यू नो यू गेट द जॉब अनलेस इट्स एन एच आर इंटरव्यू इन विच केस एटी सेवन वुड प्रॉब्लम डू राइट एंड दिस बोनस स्लाइड so whenever you give this contest you know to a bunch of people invariably there will be one smart ass who write something like this you know and i'm proud to say that i also did this so the biggest whole number nameable with a million characters of the english text right so the english text is finite right so if i consider the number of million character strings it's huge but it's finite right so now i examine all of these strings most of them will be gibberish but some of them will contain actual math right and they'll define certain new numbers numbers that could the busy beaver numbers would be included in these all of these paradigms would be included plus paradigms that we haven't thought of yet okay so obviously these would definitely be the biggest numbers ever right but turns out this strategy is epic fail okay and i guess i'll leave it open for you all to figure out why it fails so yeah that's my talk if any of you all have any questions i'd be glad to field them No cool